Dr. Cheryl Crawford is an associate professor of uh, practical theology in that department here at APU. She's the director of the youth ministry program, and she teaches mostly youth ministry courses. Uh, she's been part of the Sticky Faith Project for quite a while, is one of the authors of the book Sticky Faith, and she will be ter telling more about that uh, as soon as Freddie makes his announcements. So, thank you and welcome. Welcome. Welcome students, those from the Free Methodist Church. Thank you all for making the effort to come out. Parents, thank you. It's a long, long day. Thank you for making the effort. What I want to do tonight is share with you research that's been going on since 2004. And so I'm going to start with the tale of two freshman students, two college freshmen. Katie launched into her freshman year at a large public university with a bang. Julia quietly and uneventfully entered a well-known private college in the Northeast. Although Katie didn't like her roommate very much, she found lots of fun and friendship by hanging out with other young women from her dorm floor. Julia bonded quickly with her Christian roommate and spent most of her free time with her. For Katie, partying began on Wednesday night and didn't end until the wee hours of Monday morning. Drinking five or six beers, smoking pot, became a mainstay of Katie's daily regimen. And Julia, on the other hand, was shocked by the pervasiveness of alcohol at her school, but eventually decided, along with her Christian roommate, to drink a maximum of one drink per party so that they could at least hang out with their newfound friends. Katie decided not to look into Christian fellowship groups or even a local church because she didn't have time. And a friend told her that they were clicky anyway. In her words, she decided to put her faith on the shelf until after college. Maybe after college, she'd start to think again about God, but she was at the same time feeling somewhat empty and yet couldn't find her way back to God. Julia immediately got involved in a campus fellowship group and a local church and described her faith as challenged but growing. Two girls who grew up in youth groups, youth groups probably like the ones you're used to, the ones I'm used to. Two very different life stories with two very different faith trajectories. So the goal of the College Transition Project, we basically were trying to understand the variables involved in a transition as students moved from high school in and through college and trying to define, try to identify what are the key components in youth ministry that really help uh, produce or help students really desire a continual growing relationship with Christ. And so we started in 2004. And what we found was that for many youth group graduates, the transition to college is rocky at best. Recent research done by Barna, Lifeway, Group, Gallup, and the National Study on Youth and Religion all point to the fact that 40 to 50 percent of graduating seniors drift from their faith during their freshman year of college, and they don't return until they're 30-something. So we lose a good 12 to 14 years with these students as they moved away from their faith, making that transition from high school through college, and they simply can't find their way back. So we initiated the College Transition Project. I worked with colleagues over at Fuller Theological Seminary, and we had two different uh, portions of the study. There's a quantitative study. There's a quantitative um, aspect of it. Quantitative means survey instruments, basically. And what we did was we sent out surveys, uh, interview instruments, but they were all online. And basically they went through the email and students would respond to those questionnaires and then return them. So we followed three different groups, three different cohorts as they made their way through college. That was the quantitative part. My role was the qualitative. And what I did, and quite honestly, after reading um, Christian Smith's National Study on Youth and Religion and realizing that he was doing phone interviews with kids he didn't know, I questioned the data. I'm like, well, is he really getting the truth? Because these kids don't know who's on the other end of the phone, 
and he's getting them to talk for like 45 minutes. And I'm like, how do you talk? How does that happen? These aren't the kids I know. The kids I know want to talk to people who they know. And so I chose 15 high school seniors who I knew, some simply by name, some I had knew much more deeply and even knew their families uh, very well. And I knew them from a ministry setting. So I interviewed each student for over an hour, three different times during their college career. I drove, well, let me tell you about my journey. In a nutshell, and I know that's, uh, that's not the abominable snowman on the left there, that is me. That one, um, I traveled basically up and down the East Coast. All of these students were in colleges on the East Coast. I visited them on their college campuses. And so, as you can see, some of them were in the northern sphere of uh, the East Coast, very cold. And I did these uh, throughout. I did uh, one their freshman year. I interviewed them their junior and then their senior years. Spent time with each one of them, driving, flying, um, and then driving to each one of their campuses. Once I arrived at their campus, I would ask them, where do you want to be interviewed? And it was their choice because, again, I wanted them to be comfortable. And so some of the interesting things that happened was we, we went from public places to private places. When I first interviewed them, and this was freshman year, you know, like I say, some of them knew me very well, some of them not so well. And so coffee shops, library, study rooms, those kinds of things were happening. Um, but by the end of it, they were inviting me into their dorm rooms, into their apartments. Um, really, I mean, I, I think I became a regular part of their life. And so I was invited in um, at a different level. What was interesting too, though, was I was driving either north to south or south to north, just depending on which year you know, it was that I went, because I decided to mix it up a little bit. But there was time, obviously, and you could see, I think my odometer is something like 2,000 miles or something ridiculous like that. But what was happening was it gave me great time to reflect. It was wonderful, because as I left interviews, I would be driving and reflecting upon you know, what had just happened. A funny story, um, one of the uh, institutions, universities that I visited was the University of Vermont probably the most liberal of, uh, of the group that I visited. And I mean that in multiple uh, senses. For one, pot. Pot is just rampant, rampant. And so I found myself, it's very interesting, just even subconsciously as I'm going down the road and I've got my iPod there, and I'm thinking, oh, what do I want to listen to? Well, don't you know, I cue up the Doobie Brothers. You know, Jesus is just, oh yeah. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, how crazy is that? But it just becomes such a part of the whole deal. And just, you know, to me, it was like, wow, this is really impacting me. But the other part about driving to each of these campuses is, you know, cell phones. Funny thing. And these students all know each other, okay? So I'm up in Vermont, and I'm driving all the way down to Virginia. That's the end of my trek is Virginia, but I'm stopping in all these other cities and colleges along the way. And so they're texting each other. So do you know what she means when she asks about high-risk behavior? sex you know so they all knew my questions before i got there which was pretty entertaining so they knew they knew what was going on um other things though that were interesting to me um shocking to me their honesty was absolutely shocking to me i was amazed at even on my first trip the stories that they told um, the honesty the detail um, and the pain which i'm going to talk a lot about but their stories were just so candid, so um, unfiltered. And I, and I was really shocked by that and honestly privileged by that, that they would share the depth of what was really going on, um, on uh, just as authentic as could be. Um, and so I want to begin with a theoretical framework and just kind of you know, position all this so you can see where I was coming from when I started. My hypothesis was that faith identity develops along the same trajectory as identity development. And so today I would say they're related, but certainly not the same. And so I'm going to begin by looking at a little developmental schema here. Many of my students will recognize this. This is uh, Eric Erickson's uh, psychosocial development. And what you can see about Erickson is that he kind of situates identity development in adolescence. It's right smack there. So he's saying that you work, this is the time when we figure out who we are. Adolescence is it. Well, I would argue against that today. Um, I don't think that's actually what happens. 
And I would say um, Keegan has added, has, ma has made a great addition. Robert Keegan in 1982 wrote this, I believe Erickson misses a stage between industry and identity. His identity stage with its orientation to the self alone, who am I? Time, achievement, ideology, self-certainty, and so on captures something of the adolesc of late adolescence or early adulthood, but does not really address the period of connection, inclusion, and highly invested mutuality, which comes between the more independence-oriented periods of latency and late adolescent identity formation. What Keegan's saying in his correction to Erickson is, you know what, the very first thing students need to figure out is, who do I belong with? You know, who's my group? Who do I hang with? You know, who are my peers? And that really helps them then define who they are as people. So what I would suggest is that this has contributed to much of what's going on in college. In other words, Keegan is saying this is happening in junior high. He wants to see this inserted before adolescence, before later adolescence. And I'm saying, yes, it happens then but I think it revisits again at college. So, some of the findings, the college culture and experience. Loneliness, loneliness was the number one finding consistent across the board, all 15 students, and I don't care if it's introvert, extrovert, uh, socially inept, those who are just incredibly endowed socially. It did not matter. Every single student talked about loneliness and to the point that many of them came to tears. Now, I went to visit them spring of their freshman year. They were reflecting back and talking about their first semester. Many of them had thought about dropping out. Many of them had thought about just quitting it all together. Um, some of them were actually on antidepressants by spring semester because that loneliness, the depth of that loneliness. And this is where I think it relates to Keegan, is I think there's almost a, um, a revisit to that early adolescence. Think about it. When you come out of high school, when you come out of that senior year of high school, you're at the top of your game. You know, you know everybody in the school, everybody in the school knows you, you got your friends established, you know your routine, you know where everything is, you got it figured out. You then move to a college campus and all of these students had left their hometown to go away to college. And you don't know anybody. You don't even know your way around the dorm, never mind the campus. Everything is brand new. You've left these deep, significant relationships and now been transported to a place where nobody knows you and you don't know anybody. It makes a lot of sense. The depth of their loneliness was palpable. But, and this is probably, well, let me read you, actually, let me read you one of the quotes from one of the guys. I actually had a pretty hard transition. I struggled a lot the first couple of weeks and into the first semester. I really had a hard time um, sort of meeting people just because I felt overwhelmed because it was such a big place and making friendships that were of substance and you know, like the people that I could really rely on, people that I could actually talk to. So I found that was really hard and I'm, I struggled a lot with that. One of the girls called her best friend from home five times daily. Another one, one of the guys said that he thought he needed to tough it out. So he refuses to call home or takes, take calls from home. He was a mess. So for others, this loneliness actually leads them to doubt God and to doubt God's presence. Caitlin, who's a student who actually did really well through the faith transition, says, I felt lonelier since I've come to college. Sometimes I'm like, why am I feeling lonely? If like, well, if I feel lonely because I'm not surrounded by my family and sometimes here and I'm not like friends with my roomie and all my friends are on another floor, Sometimes I just feel like alone. And that kind of leads to doubting, kind of like, are you there, God? Like, you know, why don't I feel you here? But at the same time, sometimes like feeling lonely, like, you understand, like is very popular, like <laughs> compels me to like kind of run with him more and draw closer to him. This was definitely the most reflective of all the students. And again, this was a freshman year reflection. So her talking about where are you, God? Because I don't feel you. I feel so lonely. Where are you? Why aren't you present in my life? But this is the outcome. 
and that's the party. I would say, hands down, the party scene at college. And realize, I chose students who were not going to Christian colleges. I chose students who were going to uh, public or private, but all secular schools. Um, purposely, I wanted to see what happened with them. But this led to the party scene. In other words, they went, they went to the party, not to get drunk, not to get high. They went to find people. They were desperate to find others. It's not about drunkenness. It's about finding friends and developing relationships. So one of the students said to me, yep, I think it could get pretty lonely if you don't drink. Another one, one of the girls. OK, a lot of likes in this one. College where it's like, I feel like everyone feels like that's like what you have to do to be social. I mean, I've never felt pressured to, but it's almost like, like you have to. I don't know, you feel like you like, beca it becomes like reflexive thinking. You start to want to because everyone else wants to type of thing, and you have to realize like that's the decision you have to make. She's talking about going out and partying. And I'm talking about partying, not just partying like being there, I'm talking about partying and drinking, smoking pot, you know, everything else that goes with a party. So she says, it's the only way to meet other people. And she says, I don't know how I would have met anybody if I didn't go to the parties. And so this becomes their solution to the loneliness. It's not about getting drunk. That's what happens. But it's not, that's not their purpose. So it's kind of interesting. I think most of us look at it and say, oh, they're going to get drunk. You know, that, that's purposeful. No, no, but that's the end product. But what else happens? Well, you add the party. And oh, by the way, I, d I did forget to, or haven't totally forgotten to mention pot. Um, pot, you know, the use of pot is really high now on college campuses. Um, I really actually thought in Vermont I might get high myself just by walking around. It, it is very popular, and I don't know where they're growing it, but it, I mean, they got to have a lot of it going. But I mean, it's very, it's extremely popular. And let me tell you how many lectures I got about the health benefits of pot. I mean, students were adamant to, you know, I guess convert me, but I, I didn't buy it. I didn't buy it. Um, the other part, it's community. It's very much community. Uh, it's a community practice. You know, there's pipes, there's bongs, um, but they buy it and they definitely share, which I think is a little different than the 60s and 70s. I don't think we were so big on sharing. I think they're definitely much more community. So I guess if there's a positive spin, that's it. 420 on college campuses, April 20th, forget it. It's, it's National Pot Day, it's Hitler's birthday. For many of us, we remember Columbine, you know, happened on that day. Um, but there were two universities I visited where they actually canceled classes. Um, yeah, because of pot. And of course they said, oh, don't smoke pot. And then they had areas designated where they could smoke pot, which is very exciting. I missed it by a day. That was too bad. Uh, anyway, yeah, see, yeah. Okay, um, sex. Everybody, everybody, girls and guys, everybody acknowledged that this, it's, the increased sexual behavior was directly linked to the amount of pot and the amount of drinking that was occurring. Everybody knew it, everybody knew it. The guys knew it, the guys knew that they could take advantage of girls, the girls knew they would be taken advantage of. I mean, it, it was crazy how, how obvious it was to all of them. Um, it was it just right on their radar, they knew it. Hookups are very common and not regarded as sex, not even a part of it. Um, they also are very much into friends with benefits and there's no awkwardness. Now that freaked me out. I'm just like, well, so one guy described hooking up with a girl who's one of his friends and I said, so how'd it go the next day? He says, oh, fine, we're friends. I'm like, well, did you have an awkward conversation? No, why would we? I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a different world.